working with wire or jewelry or, you know, you spent a summer working on a bridge. Has anybody worked with metal? Let's see who did that. Okay. And then, how about casting? Anybody ever done any casting? All right, well, I, I, I'm going to take that poll again in just a minute and, and give you some idea of part of what we're going to be aiming for. So, if you've ever baked a cake, put the batter in the tin, slammed it in the oven, taken it out, put it upside down. If you've ever gone to the beach and taken moist sand and put it in a Yes, exactly. You cast, you know. If any of our other generation where you use creepy crawlers or, you know, any, any of those things, Play-Doh crammed in some service, you cast. And for those of us who are together here because we're either docents or docents in training, that becomes important because you're less intimidated. You now have, you know, a major idea in a visual in your head, and that is that you have a negative, you create a positive, and that's where you're going. Sorry, here we can't see you. Oh, can't see you. maybe it's better to say right. Yeah. 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 talking about what your brain does, 
or that you have vasculature and you need oxygen and there's skin around the bone, so forgive me if I, you know, I tap my foot and leave you. Um, but, you know, as, as sculptors, which is what pertains mostly to us here at the museum, um, you're going to see people working in steel, in stainless steel, like the um, horned toad outside, and corten in bronze, um, copper, these two owls that came off of a building in Pennsylvania, I believe. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but their repoussé work is my, is what I think. And um, so copper is really, of all the things, you know, like lead and tin, you know, very, very easy to work with. So in repoussé, it's one of, not for me, but for, for people working in a soft metal, it's an easy thing to do, but you're working from the reverse. So they had to think when they were tap-tapping and molding from the other side and creating that kind of relief, um, they have to do like we do in casting. They kind of have to think backwards and upside down and, and all around. But um, it's hammering and it's stretching and it's um, working the metal so that you can create. And sometimes, um, you know, people work with a reverse mold. Um, that's the other caveat I should mention while I'm up here today is everything that I can tell you is like anything in life. If you ask a bookbinder how to bind books, everybody has their own way. You know, I look at somebody like Steve Kestrel, whose works we have in the museum, and he works in metal, and he works in sandstone, and he works in, you know, and he does amazing finishes, and, you know, there's, he's a pretty talented guy. But I can give you the basic framework, but like everything, even your cobbler, they're going to have their own unique ways of doing it. And I'm going to give you the general, but know that, again, literally, it's not written in, in stone. Every, we all have our own strange ways. I mean, Rodin himself, actually, um, he played pretty fast and loose. He, his education was from um, an actual commercial foundry. It wasn't an educational program in, in an art school or anything. So, you know, you get pretty facile having to do something when you're making your livelihood at it. Anyway, he was notorious for for instance, loving his plasters and giving them away, and as we all know, that became popular again in the 60s. You know, the pop artists, they just they didn't have money or inclination for bronze, and so they'd make a lot of things from a pie to a leg to a, anything else out of, um, um, out of plaster. So, <laughs> getting back on track here. So, why would, why would um, an artist choose a particular metal? Some of it is going to be what's available to them. Part of it is going to have to do with um, where that object is going to live when they're complete. Is it going to be inside a museum? Will it be outside on a sculpture trail? Will it, you know? And some of it is, does that um, medium reflect the information that they're trying to impart at that moment? Um, since lovely Emily brought this out from the bowels, this was one of the best things I got to do when I was asked to give this talk was go rummage around the basement and attic of the museum. So this is by Dr. Bert Brent, and he's a reconstructive surgeon. And what's really interesting for me, you know, I have no idea, I don't know the man. There isn't a lot written about his art, there's a lot about his reconstructive surgery. But this is, this is stainless steel, that he's reconstructed this wonderful pronghorn. And it's, um, you know, it's interesting. What went through my mind was, is he using stainless because, you know, you've got all these surgical instruments? Is he doing it because, uh, again, it reflects something that has a kinship with him about this particular creature and its environment, combination of all of the above. Um, working, working with something like this, uh, it, it, well, I should have another proviso. Lots of sculptors come up with a design and they don't necessarily implement it themselves. You know, a lot of people use a foundry. A lot of people, like Steve Kestrel, I believe, does a lot of his own, his own work. There are others, um, you know, it, it's a whole team. A lot of metal work is a big collaboration. So I don't know whether he personally welded and did this. Usually you would take a mold first 
and then begin to either move your metal over it or <clears throat> emulate it in some way by um, by both shaping it with a hammer and welding it together. You always have the problem of when you weld one place, it's going to pop up another. Um, in all honesty, uh, I'm going to assume that he did it that way. <laughs> he did it that way, but it's a very thick piece. This pronghorn, and uh, but anyway, those are some things to take into consideration when you're wondering why they chose this medium. What I mean. Even Nicola Hicks, who did the little bear, the new piece that we have out in Johnson Hall, she says, and it's true for all of us who are creative, there is, whether you're a photographer, whether you're working on metal, anything, there's, a, there's you in the work. You cannot separate the fact that um, he's a reconstructive surgeon, he likes working in steel, he, so, you know, that bear isn't just little bear, that's N Nicola Hicks, and bear form. And she makes a very strong, loud <laughs> um, commentary about that. And it's part of what's so fun for her, is representing herself. So um, so there's repose, just for a little review. And there, you know, there's welding. To keep in mind, brazing, soldering, welding. Brazing and soldering, you know, for, oh, like, you know, if you're putting together a um, an old roof, or your soldering jewelry. I mean, you look at brazing and soldering as kind of like the glue that holds the metal together in those cases. We don't use those traditionally for big pieces. You use them for softer metals, and you use them for, oh, uh, like if somebody's reworking an old roof, they might, you know, use a little lead um, and a soldering iron or something, you know. Those are what those are used for. Used for for um, our purposes at the museum, you're going to talk about welding. And welding, though you have stick welding, which is kind of, again, like using a, a stick, then you're melting and it's kind of glue-like. Primarily what you're doing in MIG and TIG welding, and MIG stands for metal inert gas, and if anybody remembers their, you know, their chemistry classes, the inert gases, you know, are the ones that, well, think of us inert in bed, you know, they're kind of supposedly laying back and taking life easy and not too react, you know, the non-reactive crowd. Um, and then tungsten inert gas. And you, your MIG welder you can have at home, have it in your garage, do any number of things from, you know, fix your exhaust pipe to, you know, make your own sculpture at home. It's, it's a simpler, um, slightly sloppier, depending on who's doing the welding um, technique. But, you know, I know welders that will swear by MIG welding over all else, and they're excellent, and they, you know, leave a beautiful, what's called a bead, a line. Um, but most people, and for the more um, hardy metals, are going to use TIG welding, tungsten inert gas. And all you really need to do is, uh, let's see, how did I remember it when I first MIG? is earlier in the alphabet, so think about that as the easier, simple. You don't have to remember metal inert gas or tungsten inert gas. Tungsten, again, is the one that, you know, most welders who are more accomplished and working in a lot of metals, whether, you know, it's steel, bronze, otherwise, that's going to be their preferred. There's also oxyacetylene. One of my favorite artists, I got to, like the wizard, go behind the curtain. <laughs> One of my favorite artists, he was actually a Russian emigre and grew up in um, Egypt and then spent really the rest of his life here. I can pass it around, but just beware, it's so old, pages fall out. So he basically used oxyacetylene. And what he would do is create a framework of wire and then drip his bronze work onto it using a torch. And lots of times people use the oxyacetylene torch for cutting as, as well. I'll just, just hold it together. <laughs> um, and, he, you know, he was really unique because, again, you know, coming up at the time of the abstract and expressionist and other people of that ilk and has nothing to do with wildlife art. Um, you know, he, again, had, a, had that playful sense of using a, a medium in new and different ways and kind of light-handed and light-hearted. Um, and also, I was telling somebody earlier, and Carrie, feel free to jump on in. I sort of want this to be more like a Baptist Amy Church uh, than a, you know. Amen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> than 
Protestant, we're not doing all those. So I ask questions or, you know, correct me when I'm wrong or anything. Um, so, let's see. So we've got repoussé. We've got the, um, and we, the, you know, hammering and forming and welding. Um, you know, those are the main things you will see around here until you make the leap to casting and sand casting. Um, and most of that is in aluminum, is in bronze, um, not too much, ca it, there is iron casting, but not too many people do it for the long haul because it is like cast iron, like when you think of your burner on an old stove, it's brittle, it's, uh, uh, people don't like to weld it, it's harder to weld and make a nice clean weld. Um, and um, there are a number of ways that people cast. As an example, don't mind the silver spray paint that was my daughter's doing. These are actual <laughs> palm granites. It was a good thing. It was a holiday oh, wow. thing. Um, so these are actual palm granites that I got when they were fresh and nice. And I let them get so they're like this. I'll pass them around. Um, Sure. So I did what's called direct casting with these. And you'll get a good view in a moment or two. Carrie and I are going to put on a, a short film that will give you the visuals. So with those, it was a really interesting direct casting because I could use the thing itself because it's going to burn up. So I dipped it in wax. And then I did what's called sprueing it, which you will see in this <laughs> video. And then these were cast in what's called ceramic shell. You can do a sand mold, which you have a picture of in your book. That big indentation in sand is actually a piece I did in a sand mold um, at an iron pour, which is how I got started <laughs> doing all of this. Um, so you, you dip your piece after the wax covering is dry in a slurry and in sand, and then a slurry again, and sand again. You do this a number of times, and it dries. Each layer has to be completely dry before you get to the next layer. <coughs> then you do what's called a burnout with the ceramic shell. So it goes into a little oven. It heats up almost to the temperature that, like if you're casting in bronze, let's say 11, 1200 degrees, clears it out. There's your lost wax. Now in this piece, since I used an actual thing, but you know, it, it is combustible, so it will burn, that goes up too. If you make the mistake of using something that's a little harder, uh, you have, it, it gets a little messier and sometimes something doesn't burn out completely and then you don't fill it completely when you're filling it with your bronze or your aluminum or your iron. <laughs> so after the burnout, um, and you assure yourself that it's all clear, cleaned out, what happens Next is, if you're pouring in, in your metal, aluminum, let's say, or bronze, um, you then heat that up to its temperature. You have to reheat the shell um, because, think about it, you know, what happens when you pour a hot liquid into a cold pan? Yeah, so it, 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 it'll, it'll either not make itself solid, it'll separate, it'll... You know, there are all kinds of things that can happen, especially if you're using iron. Um, so you heat them up, you fill them up, you let them cool. Then, as you'll see in the film, you know, you, you tap them out, you clean them up. Now, it's my obligation now at this point, since I work in metal, <laughs> to tell you, everybody thinks casting is a piece of cake. It's easy. You know, why should this cost so much money when, oh, it's just so simple. You're just like your creepy crawlers. You're filling it up with rubber and you come out with a little insect, right? Yeah. Well, as this is going to show, and as the um, Gerald Belsiar molds that we have an example of, and we'll kind of tour out there and see, um, it's anything but. It's very labor intensive. And Carrie, if you don't mind. So this video is not mine. I have to give credit to the American Sculpture Society. We're borrowing their, um, their video because it's very concise. Um, and it shows you all the parts. So this is actually what you're looking at right now is their molten metal in a crucible, which is a very heavy, giant bowl, <laughs> depending on what you're casting. Um, and what they're doing right now actually is skimming. They're getting the slag off.
Okay, so here they're showing you the finished piece that's in bronze. One of the reasons that you would use shell over a sand mold, though sand is the oldest, is to get that kind of detail. Um, it also sort of depends. You, you, I don't know too many people that use shell for really large projects. The other thing to keep in mind is a piece like this isn't necessarily made whole and intact. It is oftentimes because of the way you have to let the gas out and the molten metal in, it's done in parts and then it's welded together afterwards. How many parts would that be? Um, well, something like that, not knowing the size of that, I'm assuming it's bus size, so they probably did do something like that. But for instance, um, let's say we, I'm trying to think of a... Like the Sandy like Scott's moose out on the sculpture trail? Right, like something like that was going to be in multiple pieces and then welded together. I mean, for numerous reasons. One, um, unless you have a commercial kind of foundry where you can pour that much of any metal at one time, you're not going to be able to melt enough, have a vessel enough like that crucible to contain it and pour it without it separating. And what, what starts to cool first is then hit by the hot metal and you will not have a solid piece. I, you know, it's sometimes fun if you're working on abstract works when that happens. It can be really interesting, um, but somebody's putting this amount of time into this kind of piece, no. So you'd want, um, you'd want to do it as carefully as you can. Lots of times, well, we can, we can get the, okay. I'm sure we'll hit some of these details in the, in the film. Okay, so they're showing you molds there. Now, remember back in the day, all people had to work with was plaster, or before that, clay and ceramic. So here they're making a piece out of clay. This kind of clay would have more oil base in it. Um, then they would take um, and make, and this is where, as I said earlier, people oftentimes have their own way of doing. This is a little more traditional, so they made a clay mold, a cl uh, clay figure, then they made this plaster mold, just for your information. So these little notches and spaces, that's so that you make sure that your mold fits together really well. And though I don't think they show it in here, um, when we cast, we literally band that up. You don't want, you want to make sure that molten metal is staying in there, not oozing out. So you make what are called those key marks so that the mold fits together really well. So again, they're just showing you the thickness of the mold, um, that we don't mess around, play it safe rather than sorry. Um, and just out of curiosity, so for years we've called it Plaster of Paris. Anybody know why? <laughs> no. So it, because way back when, the gypsum came from the Montmartre reason, um, no. region of, um, of Paris. So it's just not an, as, as anything is in a name. So, the, all right, we'll jump ahead a little bit. <laughs> tapping my foot again. These um, molds. Now, if an artist had no desire to make the piece again, or their agreement was to uh, make X number of a piece, you know, like an addition of 50, then you would be saving, you would save the mold till you had those 50, and then traditionally the mold would be destroyed. Because if that's your agreement, that's how you're selling it, or your gallery or museum <coughs> expects it. Um, but that said, there were people, as I say, like Rodin, who um, <laughs> saved his plasters and gave them to his friends, <laughs> or thought they were more interesting sometimes than the bronze. Okay, sorry, carry on. Okay, so now he's pouring what would have been back in the day beeswax, and now it's a petroleum-based product, into a mold. Now, the, you make a layer, then you make another layer, and another layer, you heat it up to make sure you get it in there evenly, and you know he should be tipping it around and making sure that it gets all over. The thickness of that wax in that mold will determine the thickness of the final product, uh, the final sculpture, not including um, whether or not, you know, there's shrinkage or a little expansion and every metal has its own. And also, every bronze, though bronze is traditionally tin and copper, 
that's what our ancients would have worked with. It's not anymore. In fact, the Benin bronzes from Nigeria, now that we call bronze, um, are actually what we work with as, as brass. It's more, you know, they had copper and zinc. And one of the, while well, we're paused here, one of the really interesting things about that, I mean, think about it. You know, the majority of the periodic table is what? It's metal. You know, it's, it's predominantly metals. And how many yellow metals are there? There's gold. So a lot of, you know, the ancients, when they were working, or when they saw their bright and shiny object in the form of gold nuggets or whatever, you know, probably did. It wasn't just happenstance and finding these soft metals to work with and what was there. You know, it was probably trying to emulate that. Because when bronze comes right out of the mold, what does it look like? It's a yellow metal and it looks like gold. So we can continue. Okay, so now um, this is a rubber mold that he's taking off. And what he will, it's often called the mother mold. And then he's revealing that wax that he was pouring in and out and then allowing to dry. He'd do that for some amount of time and let each layer dry before he put that in again. Um, so it's kind of like undoing, you know, the chocolate rabbit. This is kind of, <laughs> it, this is very interesting. This is another aspect of what makes it so labor intensive. This is called wax chasing. So depending on what you want your finish to be, if you're like Steve Kestrel, who does some of those beautiful, very smooth, very challenging, those are not my favorite <laughs> because it takes a lot of work. You use soldering irons, you use a lot of the same tools you use in sculpting for doing this, what's called chasing, which is essentially just cleaning up the wax mold. So you can heat it, you can take, I've taken spatulas, I've, you know, anything that kind of works for you, you use. And I know a lot of artists that might be known for a certain kind of surface or patina, they have their own little tricks of the trade or some, you know, some special something they use. Um, very challenging to get a smooth surface um, and have it. So here again, they're showing him chasing the... Now they're doing what's called sprueing. So when you have molten metal go into a mold, you have to have some place for the gas to escape. So you have what are called vents, and you have sprues, and then they'll show you in a second, you have a cup-like object, which will allow you to pour the molten metal in without splattering so much. I mean, if, if I guess he's still working on that same figure, you know, if you had to just pour it into that head. Um, but, so, determining where you put those vents, where you're sprueing, how the gas is coming out, and, and the molten metal is going in is, is very important. You know, there are people that spend a long time learning that. This is the um, shell casting. So he's dripping that in the slurry now. Then he'll roll it around in sand, and that happens, oh gosh, I forget right now. I think it's something like eight times. Bad stuff. This is all silica dust, so one always wants to, you know, be protected. Then it sits each between each of those eight or so dippings and rollings, you know, like making truffles, it has to sit and dry thoroughly. So it's usually in a very contained room with a lot of fans blowing and you will never want to walk in there or clean up a shell mold without wearing a mask, even though they show you in here, no mask. <laughs> so with these racks, they're just trying to make sure air circulates around them. Okay, so here, is um, you know a big furnace where they're uh, where they're melting the bronze. Every foundry, every artist, they have their own little mixture of bronze. It's it's not always just copper and tin. Or I mean, in China now, it's sort of all scrap metals, you know, thrown in with whatever copper they can get. In the marine world, they're using silicon with the bronze because it protects. Um, against corrosion a little better. So a lot of sculpture you see outside, they're, it's silicon bronze. Um, the other thing you always have to worry about is um, galvanic corrosion. When you have more than one type of metal together 
or even one type of metal and water, and as we always have electrical current, for instance, on a boat, um, you have to worry about galvanic corrosion. The lesser material, you know, it all, it hastens the, the corrosion. And when, it, it's particularly so if you have, you know, like a copper, steel, and something else together, or the different kind of metals, for instance, you would have on a boat. So they're pouring into that cup, and you can see the screws. He would have, as they did in the beginning, be taking that slag off the top because, you know, that's um, all of the sort of nastier bits and pollutants in the metal. Now he's banging off the shell, he's putting it then into um, a blaster, either a sand blaster or a bead blaster to clean it up even more. And that's only the beginning. You know, you have to cut off all those sprues. You usually recycle that um, bronze. Now he's starting all over again. If he has to weld pieces together because um, his mold was separated, he's doing that. But you also do the same kind of chasing that you did with the wax with the finished metal, you know, because it doesn't come out looking all pristine. And as you can see, it's a, you know, a yellowy color. Those are all the tools, you know, you, use grinders, you use wire wheels, you use hand tools. I mean, the, to, to keep it simple, you know, you just have to remember that all the newfangled things we have now, CNC, you know, plasma cutters or CNC machinery or trip hammers where we just had an anvil, a hammer and fire or what, they're all extensions of our hands. You know, keep it, keep it real simple when you, you know, you want to enlighten somebody about the metal work. I mean, these are all just extensions of our hands. It's making us a little, making it a little easier for us to get in those nooks and crannies and or remove that material um, in a quicker fashion. So now he's doing what's called a hot patina, a hot finish on this piece. And this is all better living through chemistry. You know, you're, you're, you're using chemicals pure and simple that have a reaction with the metal. So I need to remind myself here about, um, let's see, like ferric, let me see where I have it. Well, anyway, things like ferric sulfites and, uh, and nitrites and other things create um, their own colors. I think it's the sulfites that do reds and nitrites, anyway, blues and greens or whatever it is. Some, uh, some artists I know, They'll have a tricky patina. They'll literally take a jar of urine and put it on the bronze because that has the finish they want. Um, there's, this, this is a book that's strictly about patinas and about how you're, you know, mixing and melding literally just chemicals to, you know, it's not like you get a little kit with a little bit of blue pigment here and a little chemical here and you mix them together. You're creating a chemical reaction with your metal, whatever that is. Um, as, as an example, when the lights go on, you'll be able to see it. I have um, an artist friend of mine and a mentor of mine, Jean Jawrunner. She lives in the high plains of New Mexico. And she collects this dried choya um, from the high plains. Then she cross sections it. When you come up here, you'll be able to see it. it looks sort of like a flower power from the 60s. Then she, we'll pick up the aluminum one because it's lighter. <laughs> then she embeds them in wax, just the kind of wax you saw there. And then she casts these. And you know, you never know it was a choya plant. It looked, you know, it looks. But she, each one of these, I have an example of an aluminum one, bronze one. Um, a bronze with one of her coatings and patinas on there, um, and an iron one. And you can feel them, feel the difference between all of them, and also see how they, um, you know, react to a different kind of coating. And there's, there's no way necessarily that you can always duplicate these. Um, even if a foundry is using the same kind of um, mixture of metal, uh, even if you're using the same mixture of chemicals, uh, 
it's always a bit of a crapshoot <laughs> what you're going to, you know, you do your best to try and repeat them. Um, Claudette, what's in the slurry? Oh, the slurry, yeah. It's nasty. There's a, <laughs> there, yeah, there's silica in the slurry and some kind of, again, um, chemical, man-made adhesive, I'm not even sure. It's almost like a liquid ceramic. It is, yeah. And with the, but with the silica, it creates a ceramic-like effect around the... Um, but as you can see, it's, no. it's not like you pour it in and you get this perfect sculpture. That's months worth of work that they're showing you in a, in a heart, sometimes years. If it's a big piece, like um, uh, the pieces in the center gallery, you know, the... The Borglum? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, that's something that would have taken years to do. It would have done, been done in pieces. It would have been welded together again. You would have had to, again, um, cover up seams and, you know, erase the things that happen when you're working at metals of high temperatures. Um, then again, you know, Rodin, very interestingly enough, he, I don't know whether he's sort of like me and likes that more slovenly approach to things or whatever, but he claimed he liked leaving the same seams in. He liked people to be able to see how a thing comes together. He didn't want necessarily it all cleaned up and looking. He wanted you to see the dirty work and, and what has to happen. And, um, and likewise, you know, there was this convention, just like there is with printmaking, um, where, you know, like if you make a print, you're supposed to standardize it, right? Keep everything just, well, he didn't. If he had a new idea, he'd take that mold and rework it, or take that plaster and change it a little bit, and then, you know, pour it again. Um, well, we still have time. I don't know, does anybody have a watch and how much? Um, Let's walk so that you can get a real look at the Belsiar mold, and then I really want to see the Nicola Hicks piece. So somebody that's just making waxes sometimes, you will have somebody that's just pouring, you know, or making shell, or they just make the sand molds. So I know a foundry back in Michigan, and it's two brothers. One has never made a mold in his life. That's the other brother's specialty. And he does all the, and then there's somebody else who does the chasing, who cleans up the metal and welds, because usually it's, you, know, you want somebody welding your piece that really knows what they're doing, and, you know, there are no, mis because metal warps, you know, it can expand and contract, and, uh, so, this is, you know, emblematic of the original clay, then you have this mold, and if you're somebody that's doing replicas, you know, you wind up calling that the mother mold because you're going to have other molds that are made from that and then other pieces. But with each generation of that, you're losing a little something with the piece. So that first piece that comes out of even that mother mold is usually going to be the most pristine and robust in terms of detail. So then the waxes, um, and again, these over time have changed color when it but, you know, usually um, the bronze is going to be a really bright, shiny yellow, sort of like our name tag. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then here you can see a really elaborate finish and patina. All a patina is, we use that word really loosely now for everything from a wooden table to, but a patina, when it was um, used in the world of metal, it's just a very thin layer of crust that forms, you know, well, what you will, that protects the metal. Yes, if we're trying to um, impart something by choosing this color and that pattern over something else, but that's all it is. Like if you think of core 10 steel, all that core 10 covering, the only thing that makes that core 10 is that they have induced that crusty look. And the theory behind it is not only do they want it to look rusty, because some of us love that one, but it's protecting the rest of the metal. So it's supposed to not corrode beyond that. Um, if you left um, bronze out and didn't do anything to it, it would change over time. Like even though the Statue of Liberty is copper, um, it's something like three thirty seconds of an inch of copper, but bronze would look something similar. And and a lot of things. You, the most important thing to remember is most of like anything humans have stumbled upon. It's a happy accident. 
you know? I mean, my friend didn't go around with a bunch of urine in a jar. I mean, something happened one day and somebody decided that's going to make a nice finish. Much like after Vesuvius exploded and the bronze work that they had then was covered in ash, something called, I think it's like a Herculean finish. Anyway, it came out black. Then that became the in thing for people. Then they wanted to emulate that, so somebody thought up a way to come up with the black. Same with the Pompeii green. You know, they wanted to not make it something that you left to the hands of time. You wanted to be able to create that green, so they came up with sorry, Pompeii green, and that became a thing. And also the reason too that you don't you see a lot of sculptures, stone sculptures left over from the Greeks and the Romans. It's because any metal would be melted down when they have a war again, when they needed armaments, when they needed, you know, anything from spears to... So, um, again, it's sort of a mixture of physics, chemistry, history, anthropology, you know, it all sort of enters into it. But let's head for the bear. <laughs> Okay, so Nicole Kix is um, a British artist who was represented at the Taylor Piggott Gallery here in Jackson. And so last year at the gallery, um, she had, she works with really interesting materials. So for instance, she had her sculptures and they were, they were not yet cast. And she uses tar and straw and bits of plaster and some things that look like burlap and whatever. So, this bear was very fragile looking and sitting in the gallery. It then went to wherever it went to be cast. I'm not sure if it went back to England or it stayed here. Do you know, Jane? I don't. I don't um, but she, she works in England. And then it was cast in bronze. So without touching it, I mean, you see, I mean, feel free to get closer. You see all these little bits that were parts of her material. When you're casting, the hardest thing to do is when you have these little friable bits. Chances are, either when you're working to get the thing out of the mold, you're going to break them, or just the delicacy. I mean, this is solid, so um, you know, that's pretty safe. But, but these little bits and, and the unevenness and the irregularities, it's probably a foundry's nightmare because, you know, she would have liked all those little, and I'm sure there are probably many bits that didn't quite make it, but, so that's a tougher thing to cast than, for instance, um, you know, Anna Vaughn Hyatt Huntington's, you know, tobacco jar back in the world. You have this, a surface that you're working with, and, and for instance, when you have, let's say, the leg of the horse, let's say that's a cast piece, you would also be bridging, you'd be making armatures to a pole that you'd be um, placing you know, some of those wax rods between the legs. You want to make sure that when you're casting, all those things stay intact, they don't start to move in or fall off. Um, so, as you can see, you know, the casting is a much bigger adventure than pouring the glue in the creepy crawling trays and pulling it out. It's a lot of work beforehand during it. So, while we're here, any questions, any thoughts, any amendments, anything? Yeah, just a question, speaking of beautiful experiments, your excellent uh -huh. experiments. I was reading in the news yesterday that Brazil and Rio, for the Olympics, when they've been making the gold and silver and bronze medals, they're um, mixing it in with recyclable material. Sweet. And I, I, I don't know what kind of material it is, but I was just curious as to what you thought they might be incorporating, you know, what might be a recyclable material they that, been uh, that, that, that aluminum, would combine with Yeah, that. like those Choya, the ones that are out of aluminum back, the columns back in the room, um, aluminum cans. Yeah. So you're always, and you know, I know people that, for instance, those, when you cut off those screws in those cups after you pour, that's uh -huh. all bronze material, right? So that goes in a scrap heap and you can reuse it. Uh -huh. So let's say you get bronze from another source and it's a slightly different um, combination. Maybe it's got tin and zinc and maybe it's got copper and a little of this and a little of that. Um, 
but I'll look it up and read on it. It could be any number of things. It could be like our coins, you know, where they're trying to reduce the amount of gold and silver, and so they're putting in nickel or tin or, you know, baser metals. I mean, I don't know if they... I'll look it up and see what... But, you know, sort of anything. I mean, if the majority of it is... I mean, it's like our pennies. It's more base material now than it is copper. So they wouldn't have to have very much gold or very much silver. You know, they want it, they, and they want whatever they want to throw in there as their reclaimed material to give it the hardness, because it's not going to be the gold or the silver. Okay. You know, so you always have something else. That could be true. Too. It's true. Yeah, it could be that as well. You know, my guess is they're using as little gold as <laughs> They're not wearing solid gold medallions. I don't think they have been for a long time. But. <laughs> Anything else? I know some of you are on lunch showers and other wonderful things, so I don't want to hold you up. I'll be around if anybody has questions. Um, there was one thing I wanted to backtrack and talk about when I was talking about um, blacksmithing. It's one of the things the museum asked me to cover, and that's cold forging, which is when you take, and instead of heating up your material like a blacksmith, you're just using pressure. So it could be a hammer in bygone days, or, you know, we all have trip hammers nowadays, which are thousands of pounds of pressure on a thing. And I made a ring just by taking <coughs> old coins and putting them under the jackhammer. Then I drilled a hole in the center, and then cleaned it up and made it an actual ring in there was no solder, no bracing, no anything. It was just the pressure of that machine. So that's what cold forging is. And it does make a really solid. You can call it well when you bring the materials together. Anything that's bringing the materials together when you use the that machine. We're seeing a lot of jewelry these days Yes, yeah, some of them are probably just bending it and not even. I mean, don't, I don't know if you remember, I remember making like those spoon and fork things when I was a kid. I didn't move it up, I just kind of slowly. Because you know, silver in and of itself is, is a soft material. But depending on what they're doing with it, yeah, they could be heating it and hammering it or heating it a little bit at a time and then bending it. Thank you so much, Claudette. This is fabulous. <laughs>